countless cities across the United Kingdom, accounts of strange lights, unexplained objects, and other bizarre phenomena attract the world's attention. Record-breaking numbers of reports dominate front-page headlines and nightly news broadcasts. In Liverpool, 13 strange orbs. In Ramsgate, a giant fine triangle. In Bristol, a hovering silver object. In Birmingham, three low-flying disks. An epidemic of UFO sightings covers the British map. By the end of August, nearly 200 sightings have been reported, and the numbers are increasing. We've landed here in the United Kingdom because currently England is the world's hotspot for UFO sightings. As UFO investigators, this is exactly where we want to be, where the phenomenon is the most active. What we're getting is videographic and photographic evidence of, of orbs, of triangles, even one case related to meteorological phenomena. Bill Burns will look into a breaking case involving a police helicopter that nearly collides with a UFO and then gives chase to the object. There were conflicts. The police denied it, the Ministry of Defense denied it, but witnesses said it really happened. Pat Uskert will uncover never-before-seen video of an object that may have ties to an American mass sighting. He's pretty impressed by what he saw that night, and he thinks he, he's looking at some kind of UFO event. And Dr. Ted Ackworth will hunt down and analyze compelling pictures which seem to show a UFO approaching a tornado. The object was very, very close near this twister. Are those related? Is there some cause and effect? I'm not sure, but I'd like to find out. This epidemic of UFOs has happened before across the Atlantic. June 1952. Throughout the United States, an alarmingly high number of UFO sightings sweep from coast to coast. The following months come to be known as the Summer of the Saucers. The sightings seem to peak when two Pan Am pilots spot six glowing red disks while flying over Newport News, Virginia on the night of July 14th. But just days later, on July 19th, the wave reaches a breaking point. In the skies over Washington, D.C., air traffic controllers at Washington National Airport track several objects flying over the White House. But the objects vanish before Air Force jets can scramble. Now, there is a new summer of the saucers. This thing was just motionless. It just stayed there. And every now and then it would flash. I didn't believe in, in extraterrestrial life and, and until I saw this, this UFO. Whatever is happening in the United Kingdom has left many residents rushing to record their encounters as proof that something is going on. I'm about to meet with Steve Tuzer, who witnessed some strange lights at the height of this UFO wave. He's got some interesting video, and we're going to check it out. May 10th, 2008. University of Wales student Steve Tuzer is walking back to his dorm after a late-night soccer game. But his night is about to get a lot more exciting. Well, it was on May the 10th, about 11, between 11 and 12 at midnight and I happened to have my handheld camera. I looked straight into the sky and I saw these strange lights and they started doing these strange formations, like triangular formations, and it was like bundled together and it was just, I've never seen anything like it. So I quickly got my camera and filmed it all. Steve's video shows the unexplained formation of lights moving from west to east through the night sky. As they move, however, a fourth light appears. What you were looking at in your viewfinder, could you also see that with... Far away, because I couldn't really zoom that close into them with my camera, so they were very far away. What was their trajectory? Most of them went across the sky. Did they uh, exhibit a sort of independent movement? Yeah, it's like they were... It's like they were, like, together, talking to each other or something. I don't know, just doing something. 
and there's different formations, and then they would just disappear. I have to say, the footage is very interesting. Uh, we are looking at lights in a formation that are hovering over the town. Now, uh, because of the distance and the, uh, the quality of the camera, I can't really know what, what these lights were, but uh, that's why we're going to have it sent to the lab and have Ted analyze the footage and, and, and see what he can make of it. Steve Tuzer isn't the only person perplexed by strange objects in the British skies in the coming months. July 28th, in Barrie, 160 miles west of London, retired professional photographer Roger Williams is relaxing in his backyard when he notices something flashing in the afternoon sky just above the roof of his house. What I actually saw was um, some flashing in the sky, bright flashing. My first thought that was it was uh, an aircraft tumbling but then Roger notices the object is not losing altitude. The saucer-shaped metal object appears to be spinning in place. So you saw the object up here, and what happened next? Well, I thought um, after I watched it for a short while, I decided to go upstairs to get my camera. Roger snaps these pictures from his bedroom window. He photographs a silver-colored object against a clear blue sky. The object is blurry, but visual processing should be able to enhance the image to get a better look. Roger also captures a passing airplane, which provides an instant visual contrast that will be important in future analysis. I realized that there were no wings or anything like that. It was a, a sort of a donut shape with reflections around the edge. Uh, so obviously it wasn't a, a plane or anything like that. Roger has an unobstructed view while taking the photos. Right, so you had a good perspective right, right outside, and you weren't even shooting through glass. No, no, no glass, just straight through there. It's up in that direction. Yeah, and it looks like you were stabilizing your hand on the side of the window. That's right. Yeah. All right, well, those are great shooting conditions. After taking the pictures, Roger immediately loads them into his computer for a better look. How many did you take all together? Well, it's basically about four or five shots. And you took those over the course of how, how much oh, time? just a couple of minutes. The similar focal planes of the object and the airplane flying nearby provide important visual information. So this is a really interesting question to me, is because in this frame that has both the aircraft and our object, they appear to be in relatively similar quality of focus. So they are probably at similar distances, but I think it really depends on what the settings were for the lens. From that, we should be able to get a sense of the depth of focus. By obtaining the lens settings and aperture from Roger, Ted can now conduct a complete photo analysis to see if he can identify this silvery tumbling object. I have to say, this is probably the best photographic evidence I've seen yet. But Steve Tuzer's and Roger Williams' sightings are just paving the way for the most controversial event of the summer. On June 7, 2008, just outside of the Welsh town of Cardiff, a police helicopter reportedly preparing to land at St. Athen Royal Air Force Base is nearly struck by a UFO. To many researchers and news agencies, this is Britain's most compelling UFO case in years. I'm meeting with British ufologist Andy Russell. Andy is a specialist in UFO sightings here in Wales. Bill meets with Andy at the perimeter of St. Athen Royal Air Force Base, the focal point of the entire encounter. The whole incident started here at RAF St. Athen early hours on the 8th of June, although some witnesses have seen a craft around the area on the 7th. When the the helicopter was coming in to land. The crew noticed a small UFO approaching it at a high speed. The crew took evasive action. Originally, South Wales police claimed that the helicopter chased the UFO. 
And we've got witnesses in Cardiff and St. Malins and a few other areas that have witnessed that chase. Later, South Wales Police have retracted that statement and said that the chase never took place. Why would the police change their story? Bill has tracked down a lead that may prove the authorities are involved in a cover-up. We found a commercial pilot who was in that airspace that night. He was approaching Cardiff Airport, and the tower radioed him and said, be advised, a police helicopter is tracking a UFO in your airspace. One pilot's confession may help prove the authorities gave chase to a UFO. What were the police following? And were they trying to keep up with technology well beyond their own? The object accelerated 10 times as fast as a military jet. In the summer of 2008, the United Kingdom has become a center for frenetic UFO activity. Reports, pictures, and videos have been captured all over the country. But nowhere has a case intrigued more people than the Welsh city of Cardiff, where a police helicopter reportedly was in a near collision with a UFO and gave pursuit near St. Athen Royal Air Force Base in the early morning hours of June 7th. At least one pilot reported he was told by air traffic control that a UFO had encountered a helicopter in his airspace. Stay away. UFO hunters are in the UK to investigate the events taking place in the summer of 2008. They are working with local news agencies to locate credible eyewitnesses. With no video or pictures known to exist, the Cardiff helicopter incident is at the top of the investigation's most wanted list. Bill Burns is contacted by a pilot who says he was in the skies the night of the incident and he was alerted by air traffic control to the situation. Today I'm meeting with the commercial airline pilot who was warned out of Cardiff Airport airspace by the tower because they said they were tracking a UFO and a police helicopter. But after several hours, the pilot doesn't show for his scheduled interview. Originally, he agreed to talk with us and tell us the entire story. Then he abruptly canceled. He won't return our phone calls. His initial emails show he is eager to participate. But after the missed interview, a final email shows he has changed his mind about discussing the case and won't say why. With the pilot now out of the picture, the investigation needs to locate more eyewitnesses. Pat meets with Andrew Dagno, a reporter from Media Wales. Andrew has also experienced eyewitnesses going suddenly quiet. For him, it happened after speaking with sources inside the police department about the helicopter chase. A policeman was driving a helicopter so that he saw what he said was a UFO and chased this UFO out across the east into the Bristol Channel where it then disappeared. So how did you come by this information? The police actually reported this to us and that's what made it so significant was that it was actually coming first hand from the authorities. Andrew Dagnall's police sources confirmed that one of their helicopters chased a UFO but later, authorities offered up a contrary statement. According to the South Wales Police Department, quote, there were a variety of aircrafts of different shapes and sizes. In all probability, this sighting has just confirmed that one of these was in the area at the relevant time. The helicopter did not follow it or chase it across the Bristol Channel. Have you been able to get in touch with, uh, with the police officers that were involved in this incident? We've never actually been able to speak to him. That makes it difficult for us to pursue as a story because, you know, we're getting nothing back now from the police. 
This seems to be very common with these sightings. Something big happens and then they attempt to uh, uh, cover it up basically. I, I think we're onto something that, that something really did happen over Cardiff involving what appears to be a genuine UFO. Bill is now seeking connections between the various events taking place this summer. To further understand what may be going on, he is meeting with Nick Pope, a former Ministry of Defense investigator who was assigned to UFO cases by the British government. So we have a video that someone shot of an object over South Wales, and I'd like you to take a look at it and see if you think this resembles anything like the descriptions that you've received. I mean, it's a fascinating piece of footage. It's interesting. Many of the Cosford witnesses talked about two lights, um, and it was, it was only later that some of them, particularly those who saw it really close, noticed a third and fainter light. But, but yeah, that is similar to what's been reported at Cosford. The Cosford incident took place on March 30th and 31st in 1993. It involved over 100 witnesses who saw two or three lights on what they believed was a triangular-shaped craft. The incident entangled two Royal Air Force bases, Cosford and Shawbury. What's at these bases that would interest some kind of other craft? Shawbury is somewhere where helicopter training is undertaken. Uh, Cosford is basically an engineering base. Uh, so it's a, it's a wide mixture of different establishments. These aren't just UFO sightings, however. These are craft that actually go over the base. They hover over the base. They linger over the base. More than that, in relation to the Cosford incident, one of the Air Force witnesses told me that um, the, the object accelerated away probably 10 times as fast as a military jet. It's not just lights in the sky. When it comes to sightings at military establishments, whatever this phenomenon is, does seem to be paying particular attention. We don't know what these things are, but they're in our airspace and we want to know. Though it may be impossible to know why these sightings are happening, witnesses continue to be amazed at what they are seeing. Local media assistance has helped uncover an eyewitness who saw the Cardiff helicopter event on the night of June 7th. Sometime after midnight, Amanda Berry is in her kitchen, preparing to turn in for the evening, but soon realizes her night is just beginning. Well, I was basically, you know, sort of washing dishes, doing normal, you know, just usual things, working on my computer. Mm. Uh, you know, I looked out of the window and I basically saw this, this light, sort of a, a, an orangey sort of light. Amanda watches as a helicopter emerges behind the strange light. To her, it appears to be following or chasing the object. What drew your attention to this thing? What was unusual about it? I mean, it was flying quite quickly, but it was sort of flying in a, in a very smooth way, which you wouldn't, I mean, in a sort of broad arc. According to Amanda, it is able to evade the helicopter with relative ease. Did it appear that this thing was moving faster than the helicopter? Yes, yes, it, it, it did. I was getting the impression that the helicopter was kind of struggling to keep up with it, and, and it seemed to be flying along quite effortlessly, really. I mean, it was almost like as if it was teasing the helicopter, you know. Amanda's description matches what many local media outlets reported hearing from other witnesses. But skeptics dismiss this sighting, claiming it is something far more prosaic, a simple paper balloon known as a Chinese fire lantern. Chinese fire lanterns are often used in celebrations such as weddings, birthdays, and concerts across the United Kingdom. In fact, fire lanterns were launched the night of the sighting at a wedding in the town of Cowbridge, only five miles from the St. Athen base. This Cardiff case, guys, is really perplexing. On the one hand, you've got the newspapers reporting this as a banner headline. The police admit 
that their helicopter encountered a UFO, then the police pull back and say, oh no, nobody can talk to you. Well, it sounds like they're trying to downplay the incident, but according to some of the actual eyewitnesses, they reported that uh, they actually saw the helicopter chasing an object. The police gave this explanation that this was fire lanterns. I think we can probably devise some kind of experiment to either prove or disprove that theory. To put this theory to the test, Amanda has agreed to observe a series of fire lanterns and see if they appear anything like what she witnessed on the night of June 7th. With an eyewitness at the ready, the experiment is set for launch. Are police ignoring a case of simple misidentification? Or are they refusing to come forward because of a UFO incident at a Royal Air Force base? The investigation is in Cardiff, a Welsh city caught up in a wave of some of the United Kingdom's most compelling UFO cases in years. Video of what could be a huge craft. A strange picture of an object without wings tumbling in the afternoon sky. And a helicopter that reportedly pursued a UFO over the Bristol Channel on June 7, 2008. But official statements claim that this last incident is an overblown sighting of a Chinese fire lantern. These fire lanterns are candle-powered miniatures of hot air balloons, and they're frequently mistaken for UFOs. We have Amanda's testimony that she actually saw this thing. She saw a very strange object flying in a very peculiar fashion that was being chased by this helicopter, moving faster than the helicopter. Now, after this, this huge incident, there were reports that this was all the result of just Chinese fire lanterns. So we're here now to put that to the test. Amanda saw the object approximately 300 yards from her house. To accurately recreate her line of sight, Bill and Ted launch a fire lantern from a separate position 300 yards from Amanda and Pat. I'm down here at base one with Bill. He and I will be releasing it from here. Down this way at about 300 yards is base two. That's Pat and our witness. They're in position and ready to view our release of the lantern. What we really want is your opinion about does this thing look anything like the object that you saw on June 8th? Okay, we're going to light off the lantern, eyes in the sky. Go. Okay, we have liftoff. Copy that, we see it. Well, Amanda, well, it you looks, see it? Yeah. It doesn't, doesn't look anything it, like it what doesn't. you saw. It's a lot smaller than what I saw, and, and even at low altitude, they're small. So, well, even the lights on on the helicopter I saw were, you know, I, they they were dimmer than the the lights on the other craft. You could see that they're, you know, electric lights. They were intense. These but lights had intensity. Intense. Yeah, yeah. And this was more of a flickering candle or like a campfire. Yeah. Basically, it just didn't look the same at all, really, you know. I think you've made it clear that uh, this is completely different. Yeah from what you saw that night. Yeah. Ted, I just wanted to let you know that we've pretty much concluded that uh, what we've launched here this evening uh, uh, doesn't look anything like what Amanda saw that night. Okay, Pat, roger that. There is also meteorological evidence that casts doubt on the theory that these were fire lanterns launched from a wedding in the town of Cowbridge. Cowbridge is about 13 miles to the west of Cardiff, and the winds that night, we looked at the meteorological data, are coming basically out of the north. Now, if a fire lantern was launched over Cowbridge and, and climbed up to 2,000 feet, it would be traveling in this direction, and that is the opposite direction from Cardiff. So we've got a balloon that's launched 13 miles away, traveling basically away from Cardiff. How could that ever have been sighted over Cardiff? It, it just doesn't add up. So what does that mean? It's looking increasingly like we have to look for another explanation, and that explanation might very well be it's a UFO. 
While one experiment has helped eliminate a conventional explanation, the photos and video from Roger Williams and Steve Tuzer may provide even more evidence. Are these similar objects to what the helicopter pursued that night? Ted and image analyst Terence Masson look for any distinguishing characteristics in the evidence. Now the, the Roger Williams photos, I'm really hopeful for. For once, we actually have a professional photographer taking a picture of an object. I'm hopeful that we can get something really definitive out of this. Roger turns his 35 millimeter camera skyward and captures six images of a strange disc-shaped object that he at first thinks is tumbling, but then realizes is hovering in place. If we could do a sequential viewing of, of each of, of the object zoomed in, and take out the motion, mm -hmm. uh, we could see how it looks over the course of those frames. What we did was several things. Able to isolate some motion blur out of it and do some sharpening and contrast enhancement and actually overlay and sequentially analyze those six photographs, one on top of another. To me, this is pretty wild. Yeah, it's, um, it's definitely changing shape. To me, it looks metallic. It, it looks very yeah, clearly like silver, like an, like an aircraft body, aluminum skin, but nothing at all like the shape of an aircraft. And what we see very definitively is it's, it's roughly donut shaped, saucer shaped, if you will, and it's very clearly over the course of that short minute and these six photographs that it's either tumbling or physically changing shape. It certainly shape. doesn't look like uh, wi any kind of wings or, or a helicopter. It no. definitely doesn't fit any of our uh, conventional aircraft profile. The fact that this metallic shiny object is hovering out there in space over the course of a minute and changing shape or rotating in place is very, very puzzling. But Steve Tuzer's footage shows something altogether different. The footage is remarkably similar to another incident that's already been closely analyzed. It reminds me a bit of the Tinley Park video in that there's that formation. On August 21st, 2004, hundreds in the small town of Tinley Park, Illinois, view three orange globes floating above their city. The video analysis seems to show that all three lights are connected. It does look like the, uh, the other two trailing points are locked to that third point. But most shocking is the size of the object. I think 1,500 is a pretty good estimate, plus or minus a couple few hundred feet. And I don't know any structure that you could fly that would no. that could hold lights 1,500 right. feet apart. Ted and Terrence believe the Tinley Park lights to be a massive single triangular object. Though it does show a fourth light, the object Steve Tuzer captured is similar. It makes me curious whether or not these lights are part of a, a larger structure. All right, so we see here the stabilized footage. Yep. Uh, the yep. light on the left is the one that I actually pinned. Uh, and again, similar to Tinley Park. Mm -hmm. To my eye, yeah, they're to, pretty stable. To the naked eye, they do seem uh, about the same position. It really does seem to be the structure locked together where we're doing some sort of rotation. So what Terrence's analysis is telling us is that these four point sources are clearly locked together in, in formation, but it's a very sophisticated formation where they're, they're not just hovering together, but they're, they're rotating en masse as one object. It really leaves me wondering what this could be. One final photo could shed light on the dramatic increase of sightings in the United Kingdom. As a photographer in Lancashire, captures what appears to be a UFO approaching a tornado. Everybody has said, what is that? The latest wave of UFO sightings over the United Kingdom has seen strange triangles, bizarre silvery objects, and a helicopter pursuit over the Bristol Channel. But the most unique case might involve a UFO and a tornado. Melanie Walwork of the Lancashire Evening Post received this photo days after it was taken. 
Well, yeah, I thought it was certainly very interesting. It was crazy enough that there was the, the funnel cloud in Lancashire for a start, never mind now with this, you know, this thing next to it that no one was, you know, too sure what it was. But more compelling for Mel is the amount of sightings in the area, especially this summer. Do the sightings tend to come together in certain months of the year? There certainly has been a lot over the, the last few months, obviously the summer months. Lancashire is a hot spot. Though Mel received many calls and many reports, none had the evidence that Pat Regan did when he snapped his photograph. July 6th, 2008. Pat Regan is on a normal afternoon excursion with his daughter Jasmine in Lancashire. He takes this photo when he sees the tornado forming in the distance. When he arrives home, he downloads it to his computer for a better look. At first, it just seems to be a picture of the nearby tornado. But on closer examination, Pat discovers it contains something even more intriguing. Ted and Pat head out to meet Pat Regan and his daughter Jasmine at the exact spot of their sighting, the Rufford Canal. It almost looks like we could have another tornado again today. Yeah. Are these similar conditions now to it's, the day you had It's the a little bit cooler than when we saw the tornado. There was blue sky like this, but it was also quite thundery. So Jasmine first spotted the twister around here. Jasmine was playing the, and I heard her saying, Daddy, Daddy, there's a twister, there's a twister. Concerned at first, Pat realizes that the funnel cloud is far enough in the distance to take a photograph. He seizes the opportunity but he realizes he captures something even stranger when he arrives home. There was a speck in one of the pictures, and this is the speck that everybody has said, what is that? Pat enhances the photograph. In what seems to be close proximity to the tornado, he sees a strange greenish disc-shaped object. We don't know what it was. We said, well, could it be something from the Twister? Could it be an aircraft? But all these seem to be impossible because it doesn't seem to be anything like that. So you didn't see the UFO that day? No, we didn't. Well, we, we saw it, but we didn't register it in our brains. It was there because it was on the picture. Yeah, we only noticed later on. Do you know if, if the Twister caused any damage? Didn't get the feeling it was going to do any damage, but it only seemed to be peaking downwards some distance from actually Earth. It wasn't Earth touching was, down? It didn't seem to be. It was. When you were watching it, did you see any debris getting kicked up uh, at the base? No, we didn't. If the tornado didn't touch down, it probably couldn't have picked up something large enough to be the object in the picture. What seems strange to me is that we have a, a sighting of some unknown object associated with a strange meteorological phenomenon. And apparently the object was very, very close near this twister. Are those related? Is there some cause and effect? I'm not sure, but I'd like to find out. But with so many unidentified objects being seen this summer, many are asking why the British government isn't seriously investigating this UFO wave. The British government has upheld the importance of UFO investigation for years and recently declassified the largest number of UFO investigations in this country's history. These files contain details of hundreds of sightings of strange lights and objects in the sky from 1978 to 1992. Nick Pope, who led the UFO project at the Ministry of Defense until 2006, examined many of these cases, some of which remain unsolved. The amount of records that the MOD has on UFOs must be voluminous. Oh, absolutely, yes. We've had over 11,000 UFO reports um, investigated since the early 50s. And of course, all these cases now are beginning to come out with the release of the uh, MOD's UFO files, which has started this year. The release of the files has coincided with one of the biggest waves of sightings in the country's entire history. And so the MOD must be really frantic over what you called in the New York Times Britain's Summer of the Saucers. Yes, it, it is. But despite what seems like transparency, little information on these newest sightings is being discussed. 
uh, people are using the Freedom of Information Act to go after the records and they're not really finding them. Now, I have a theory about this. I mean, a couple of times in the MOD, somebody said to me words to the effect of, oh, well, I'm just going to write to uh, this person about this. And I said, no, no, don't do that. You'll create a paper trail. And if there is no paper trail, then officially released documents aren't telling the whole story. So when people try to research cases like Cardiff today, you're actually partly responsible for the fact that there is no paper trail on Cardiff. Well, I'm not sure if it's my personal fault. It was just the culture of, of on sensitive issues, we were aware of FOI and sometimes did a, what you might call a workaround, as it were. Could the MOD's release of the classified files just be a smokescreen for their current UFO investigations? You can guarantee that even if there is no paper trail, the MOD is well aware of these cases and investigating. With solid meteorological data, field perspective, and a photograph, this may be the investigation's best chance of determining what's in the skies over Britain in the summer of 2008. An extraordinary photograph involving a tornado and a possible UFO has surfaced in Lancashire in the UK. Could this be the evidence needed to validate the numerous sightings sweeping the United Kingdom in the summer of 2008? I'm at the University of Manchester at the Center for Atmospheric Sciences. I'm about to meet with Dr. Grant Allen, who's an expert with tornadoes and twisters. I'm hoping that Dr. Allen can give me some information about the tornado that I can use when I get into the digital image processing. Uh, this particular tornado we're looking at here is um, a very, very weak tornado uh, with wind speeds, I would say, probably less than, less than 80 miles an hour at the vortex edge. Does, this, does it look to you like this has touched down? I wouldn't say so. Normally when a tornado forms at the top of the cloud, you get a, a thicker area and that tapers off as it, as it descends and you, you can see yeah. that. One question stands out. Is this object just a piece of debris picked up off the ground and tossed out by the tornado? Dr. Allen worked up an estimate on the strength of the tornado, detailing the force needed. The maximum velocity around the edges of the funnel was about 80 miles per hour. That at as little as 10 meters away, it could be half that velocity. So we know that the velocity of the air around this funnel is dropping off very significantly. And obviously it would take very strong winds to keep some sort of debris or object up in the air. If the tornado had touched down, and if that's a relatively large piece of debris that's left over, I would expect to see more evidence of debris either around the tornado or off this, off, off this picture, maybe. We've looked very closely at, at throughout the entire frame, and that's really the one and only piece of debris that we're seeing. And it seems to be about halfway up the funnel. None of those photographs has the tornado been anywhere near the ground. So my hunch is that that is not debris. With this stage of the analysis complete, Ted turns back to image processing to determine the size, speed, or distance from the camera to the object. The question here is, what's the object? You know, an aircraft, a bird, uh, an insect? Uh, is, can we get our hands around this in any way? My first impression is that it is something of medium size at a pretty good distance. I am seeing what looks to me like motion blur on the object. Motion blur happens when the object being photographed moves faster than the camera and film's ability to capture cleanly. It is usually affected by the camera's shutter speed. Let's look up the shutter speed. Five thousandths. Right, so that's really fast. Shutter speed on a camera dictates whether the photo is sharp or blurry. Pat Regan's camera shutter was set to open and close at one five thousandth of a second. This extremely fast speed clearly captures the estimated 80 mile per hour winds of the tornado, but not the alleged UFO. 
it seems like it would have to move pretty fast when, in that very fast exposure time to still be blurred. Because anything else that was moving at any kind of relative speed, even 80 miles per hour, a fast right. car, right. I would expect that to be crystal clear. At that, you're right. At, at that show. Third phase of moon. Third. Welcome back to Third Phase of Moon. My name's Blake Cousins and we have a special guest back due to popular demand. Michael Horn, the representative of Billy Meyer, incredible case. Michael, welcome to Third Phase of Moon. Go ahead. Well, Michael's joining us via Skype live from Arizona and we're talking to him at home base, Third Phase Moon right here in Hawaii. This is gonna be an incredible uh, interview and we wanna get started with what's going on. New revelations, new insight to photographs, videos, and even people covering up the information. Let's get straight to the cover up. What's going on with you trying to get the information out on Billy and now all of a sudden people are trying to close it down, not getting the word out. Tell us what's going on, Michael. It's actually very interesting. I put out a new film just a little less than a month ago called And Did They Listen? And I submitted the film to one of the uh, administrators at Arizona State University because I thought it might be a nice place to screen the film for a few reasons. One, of course, for students and professors alike to see it and to question and challenge. And two, there's a professor named Paul Davies at that university who's written five books on extraterrestrial life, but who's run away totally from even looking at the Meyer material. It probably would ruin his career a little bit. Okay. So I submit the film, nice lady says, okay, I'll, I'll watch your film. And then she writes me back and she says, your film will not be shown or sponsored by anyone at ASU. What she said is we're banning this film. We're censoring this film. Now folks, you know that all sorts of things go down on colleges. That same college has some kind of a crazy class about uh, using condoms. I mean, quite literally, I've got this on a blog. It's hysterical stuff. But she was so intimidated by seeing this film. She watched it over a weekend's time. She could not criticize one thing. But it's so obviously busted up her belief system that she has taken the step to ban the film. Well, let's, uh, Michael, let's, let's share with everybody right now this... Uh, this new documentary that you're gonna be releasing, or it's released right now, but everybody at Third Phase of Moon, let's take a look at it right now and we'll be right back. It was a time when the people had created great turmoil, environmental catastrophes and wars on their once beautiful planet. They thought of themselves as the only intelligent beings and the crowning glory of creation. There are more advanced human beings than we are, and they're actually in contact with one man on Earth. Clearly, I mean, we would have to say, this is the most important thing that's ever happened. The core of this case, again, is a spiritual teaching, not a belief system and not sure. a religion, a teaching about human consciousness and all these things. Die Menschen müssen lernen, sich selbst zu sein, und müssen die Selbstverantwortung zu tragen lernen. Fukushima, Meyer was told within mere days, this is already a super worst possible case scenario, which will only get worse. You are being lied to, and the contamination of your seas and your air, your food chain, is going to be exponential. Okay, we're back. Now, Michael, why do you think they're banning this film? What's, what's so relevant that they don't want to get the information out to the public? Here's the deal. This film, you know, this is like my third film in, in six years or whatever on the Meyer case. It is inescapably, inescapably real. When you watch the film, we lay out so many things over 111 minutes that anybody can check out. And I know we're going to talk a little bit about the amazing wedding cake UFO that's been analyzed the prophecies, scientific information, it's so solid that anybody, 
a that has a strong religious belief system is probably going to go a little wacky. Anybody that has only been looking at UFOs for the phenomenon part, you know, let's be honest, the, the stuff that we can see on film, but we don't know if they're there, why are they there? This film lays out the reason, what it's about for us as humanity, what we need to learn because of what is already coming down the pike and that which is already obviously upon us and what's coming. People don't want to know. They want to you know, preoccupy themselves with the trend and, the, and I think oftentimes irrelevant things. College students are inheriting this world. High school students are inheriting it. And this woman, who's a very, very nice person, I spoke to her, but it obviously blew her up because you can't criticize. You can't, it's not about little aliens with big heads and big eyes. It's about real human beings who are highly advanced, who for 70 years have been meeting with Meyer, met with him as, as recently as two weeks ago. I happen to know that. And, and they continue to give him information and to keep a hands-off policy on this. It's up to us now. If, if this cottage wants to ban it, it's like trying to pull the covers over your head. It doesn't make it go away. Well, Michael, when uh, we first spoke to you, almost about a, about six, seven months ago, we were uh, happy enough and honored to share the Billy Meyer story, and the response was huge. I remember as a young child myself, watching Billy Meyer and seeing these fantastic stories, and more and more the evidence comes in. You know, people from around the world will say it's a controversial, very controversial uh, story. The evidence is there. People judge judge it with what they will. But the audience members at, here at Third Phase Moon just reacted to it so uh, much in a big time way. That's why we're back here talking about this again. And I, I want to get to some of the questions that people have come to us and wanted to ask you. And first of all, what this is about regarding this photograph, the wedding cake at night, this golden wedding cake shot. Now it's been enhanced and people want to know what's up. What, what are we seeing after this enhancement decades later? Well, this is interesting for two reasons. I'll back it up before the enhancement and say to you, there's an arrow on this one photograph and it's pointing to a band that we can see here. I found out about three, four, five years ago, I noticed that the, the dimensions on this craft changed from the daytime craft. You can see photographs of you know, the broad daylight one parked in, in front of Meyer's house and this nighttime one, the, the top of it, we could call it a cupola, extends out of the craft. And this is something that then Professor Zahi also noticed and analyzed. But the real meat of the matter when we look at this wedding cake thing here, and I am a zero of technology. I put it in Photoshop. I did exactly what he said. Turn up the contrast, turn up the brightness. And 32, 33 years later, we see that this is not a model against a black curtain. This is a really large object hovering over a road at night with a post, could be a fence post or a, a marking post that they have for you know so many meters or whatever in Switzerland. Meyer is sitting on another craft above this craft when he takes this photograph. He told people, and the beauty of this is Meyer, he's known for 32, 33 years. Hey, I took that night, we we're hovering over a road. He's never said a word. We have to find the stuff for ourselves. And this makes all the skeptics look like monkey brains. Oh, it's a garbage can that they said with Christmas tree ornaments and all this nonsense. Obviously, this is no garbage can lid. And in his third analysis of it, which is, you know, you might be able to show that or link to it, he shows the most discreet details on this thing. There are crystals that are red, that are green, that are blue, that are white. There's the skeptics said, oh, there's something that fell off. And what, you know, they were saying a piece of it fell off and sitting in the daytime. But it's not, it's a ring that's actually part of the construction. When you zoom in on the globes, these have lenses in them, like blue lenses. This is mind boggling. I don't care about any, you, know, you can look at a lot of great footage. I understand it's fascinating. This thing, Meyer is within 20, 30 feet of it. Well, you know, the pictures, I was looking at them today and we're sharing them right now. And I suggest everybody take a look at the, the photo, the nighttime photo, do your own investigation. 
put some brightness contrast on it. Watch when it pops and you'll see what Billy said all along. It basically, it appears that there's a, a floating major, major uh, wedding cake kind of flying saucer above a post and kind of like a field. Quite interesting, 30 years later, this was revealed. And now we're, look, we're looking at, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, we would, the skeptics who are obviously going to lose their screws over this and they have, they, can, they cannot respond. They refuse to now even engage. Here's the thought. We would have to believe that Billy Meyer 33 years ago is somehow smart enough with a 35 millimeter film camera to take a nighttime photo knowing somehow he's going to be able to trick 21st century state-of-the-art technology and voila we're going to see this craft is hovering over a road it doesn't happen folks he, this is one of 63 photos and when you look at the video that's freely available on my site and through youtube five minutes of zooming in and out of the wedding cake ship broad daylight this is real and he meets with these folks they're human beings they're they're not there's no extraterrestrial presence walking around on earth with the exception of when these folks drop down on him once every few weeks meet with him talk to him and he types out the contact and then they're gone there's no extraterrestrials working underground there's i mean all of this stuff that we've been told is the disinformation and it's come from the ufo industry and the ufo community fine let's look at everything let's see what we can learn from it but people the clock is ticking these people have given us information to help us survive what's coming down the pike well we just looked uh, as you're saying that at some of these detailed photos close up of the you know people claim it's some kind of model or something like that but you know 30 years ago this was if it was a model manufactured 30 years ago, the detail that uh, we're looking at here is why go out of their way to do it. It, it is quite interesting. The detail is spectacular and the technique on whatever it is, it seems extraterrestrial in origin. Now let's get to these photographs. I love these, these broad daylight photographs of uh, the saucer, like basically hovering around this tree. And this is one of the most amazing uh, metallic broad daylight photos out there. Pretty much the most controversial shots. Tell us about these and what was Billy Meyer uh, when he's taking these shots? What do you, what was he thinking? With the wedding cake, are we speaking about Yes, yeah. oh. the wedding cake next to the tree, broad daylight. Go ahead. Right, and you know, they are truly amazing photographs. He took them at various ranges of distance. When you do look at the video, you'll see him actually snapping some of the photos in that five minute video that's you know for free on, uh, on my website. He is, he actually has a little conversation during the video. He's talking to one of the ETs, asking him to move the craft. And the guy says to him, no, because they always stop short of proving so that it's okay, it's a slam dunk. You know, I sent you another link showing the UFO going around the tree of film. That's been out there now for 40, 49 years or something crazy, 39 years, whatever it is. And the, the weird part is the craft is in two places in one frame of film. There's no models involved. So to get back to the wedding cake ship, this is a craft that the play are and basically actually made just for using in our, the contacts here on earth. And they actually had to take it out of operation because the metals started to, to have corrosion from our atmosphere. But we got 63 photos and a great video out of them. And of course, everybody, you know, thought, oh, this is, as we said, it's got to be some kind of a hoax. Those detailed photographs that you show, you show those crystals, there's like a hundred red crystals around. I mean, here's a one-armed guy who's even going to sit around and try to place crystals on a, on a garbage can lid. The guy who did the best model of this couldn't even come close with the details. So we... terrestrial technology made by human beings who are way ahead of us and they're not wanting us to focus too long on this but they want to get our attention so i think to answer your question a lot of it is about getting our attention so we'll pay attention then to the information well let's take a, a quick clip a uh, quick view of uh, this documentary that appeared right here in third phase of moon uh, thanks to michael Hart. let's take a look at it right now
Das Universum, das ist schon... The universe is already very, very old, and everything took its time to come into being, even human life. The beginning is the cause from which the effect came about. It's the law of causality which has to take effect. The meaning of life is the human being's evolution with regard to his consciousness. Billy, what is God? God is an imaginary figure which has been created by human beings so they don't have to bear responsibility themselves. Rather, they can shift it onto a deity, but God in and of itself is nothing other than a title for a human being who is very highly evolved. God is also not that what the human beings take God is therefore not what human beings wrongly assume, that he is the creator, the creator of life, the creator of a universe, of space. God is nothing other than a title, be it Allah or Shiva, etc. The human being always tries to set a power above himself and he calls it God. This God or this power is supposed to be responsible for him and everything and anything that he says, does, thinks and feels and so forth and for his fate. The human being is solely responsible for each and everything he thinks, does, feels and undertakes. He must be responsible for it. He must bear and savor all the positive and negative which he processes through his thoughts, actions and feelings. Special effect artist that worked on the movie Independence Day, you reached out to him to, uh, you know, share Billy Myers' evidence. What became of that and what did they have to say? Tell us about the whole experience. Go ahead. Yes, um, it was a time that I was uh, making, <coughs> pardon me, making the Silent Revolution true, and uh, my friend, uh, one of my friends knew them, brought me to see them. They were, I think, at the time, in Culver City, they're called Uncharted Territory. Uh, Volker Engel and, and Mark, and the name is last name is escaping me at the moment. It's been probably about seven, eight years, whatever. Anyhow, um, they commented on this film uh, that Meyer took, the first film that Meyer took in 1975, where the UFO is going around the tree. Now, many people said, oh, it's obviously a, a model on strength, it got known as the pendulum UFO too for a while. And so people attacked that as an obvious hoax and skeptic, set up a miniature tree, and he you know, did a thing with a little model. Didn't do a bad job, but what just happened in the last couple of months is Professor Zagni, who did all of the analysis on the wedding cake ship, decided to go over that film book. And his findings actually validate what the Tex guy said years ago, to really do that shot right and to fake it, you would need a crane and wires and all sorts of things pulling and because it's not just an object that is dangling and spins around. Professor Zaghi showed, and of course it's linked from my blog, that the, the craft was behaving in very <clears throat> specific and unusual ways that completely eliminated the possibility of any string. The string would have had to have been shortened Lengthened the focal point would have had to move all sorts of stuff. Most amazingly, it appears that in uh, a couple times in one frame of the film, you can see the craft in, in about two places in one frame of the film somehow. And I, I think anybody that wants to again do what Professor Zahi did, he tells you what equipment he used, and you can take the film clip and, and analyze it. That isn't my specialty, and uh, of course, I'm really kind of tickled, if you will, that the two guys that own that company, the Academy Award winning company, got it right. It's not, it's not just a the little model. You would really need a crane and you'd have to manipulate because of the way the thing turns, wobbles, and backs up. So what we see at first glance, what we appear to see, isn't always what's really happening, what's really there. And that's what's so amazing about Meyer's evidence. There's a, a lot of these pictures and photographs and videos, it shows that this 
a metallic disc, you know, loves to hang out around trees. Is there a reason behind that, did Billy say? You know, what he said is, I recall, he said, you know, they wanted to just have the photos and films near objects that people could have a relationship to size-wise. They could tell, um, you know, how big this other object, the craft, would be, because these would be known objects. Now, of course, people tried to jump on and say, oh, those are miniature trees. But years ago, forestry experts were given the photographs and they said, we don't know what the, the object is, but those are mature, real 40-foot trees. How do you know that? Well, there's something called nesting that takes place at the tops of some of these trees. There's pruning marks where branches have been cut off. There's little details that just do not show up on models because basically a model tree is made to look quote unquote good. And these guys said right away, oh no, it's a real tree. It's full size, look at here. This is so that worked, except the skeptics kept on yammering about it's got to be models. I have a link and they will be showing that tonight where uh, there's a video and Meyer and a Japanese film director walk up the hill to where the tree is with the most famous one of them of the shots called the, the, the sunshine UFO photo and you'll see the photo and then you'll see them walk up to that tree it's a different season it's clearly the same tree it's a huge tree and so there's no way that some little model could have been put up there you know this just takes common sense patience looking thinking and then you get someone like professor zagi who starts ripping through these things with real state-of-the-art technology and, and you know he's got those videos he made on the analysis of the wedding ink craft and this this is just putting it in a whole other realm and all the years that it's taken us to come forward this is telling us that we're not as swift as we think we are we don't always know that's why i titled my article can you see what you're looking at well it's quite interesting people become experts in things that they uh don't understand overnight and that's uh a situation we have to deal with at third phase of moon all the time there's these metallic disc videos that we receive on a you know monthly basis of really good great ufo video and sometimes they have this pendulum effect or like a wobbly uh action going on but in you know bob lazar he apparently worked at area 51 and a lot of scientists that we've spoken to in quantum physics and all this that they say when when there's anti-gravity in that kind of state and it's in a hovering state, that's a kind of a natural reaction. It's when they get to uh, great speeds is when they start to stabilize. That's what they're all about. The design is about high-speed travel. And then, right. uh, go ahead. Well, a lot of what is being seen and filmed and, uh, and photographed is not extraterrestrial. There are a number of terrestrial groups that have advanced craft, they're not interplanetary, but some of it is anti-gravity, and some of the stuff has existed for decades. This is where people that you know are only going to focus on the phenomena are not going to get their bang for the buck. You can only go so, so far with stuff that flies around. The Meyer case gives us the reason for contact, and I wouldn't care if there were 30 or 300 other genuine authentic contactees simply aren't. They can't prove it. Lots of good footage nowadays because there's lots of testing of military craft and there is an extraterrestrial race whose craft are sometimes seen around the world and photographed and who are not the play around. They are a race that's only observing us at this time. They're not contact. All right, Michael, you know, everybody wants to know when, if ever, are we ever going to get to speak with you know Billy Myers well you know Billy just turned 77 I'm a little younger than he is but he speaks mainly German very little English now even when I go over there I have to bone up with my almost non-existent German to talk to him he gives me a break when I run out of words you know he'll speak to me a little in English but he does no more interviews he's let us come over to film him we have another shorter film that will be coming out in a couple of months where he answers questions about the spiritual teaching. It's very interesting. And we, of course, have a couple clips in this film and in another film I have out. 
but his attitude is, look, I've written 26,000 plus pages of information. If we could sit down and have a conversation together, we won't learn as much in an hour with him as we can if we just sit there and voraciously go through the material. Think about it, question it. That's the way it is with, with good information. It's why you can go to a college and you get a lecture or something, but you've got those books. You see what I'm saying? So, sure, it's great to talk to Billy, but he's just, really, being with him is just like being with another guy. The difference is that maybe 15 minutes or 20 minutes before I sat down to talk to him, he's had a meeting with some of the extraterrestrial human beings, and they were doing work, and to them it's not a big deal, but they're not going to interact with us. So, what can I tell you? Is there any new message for anybody around the world listening right here at Third Phase Moon? What's the new message from Billy Meyer coming out? Well, the new message, there's some new information, but here, here's the plain, real truth. Within a week after Fukushima, and we go into this in the new film, and did they listen? Meyer was told that this was already an ultra, super, worst possible case scenario the contamination already flowing out within the first several days had already reached Europe, the radioactivity. That's more than two and a half years ago. Fukushima is going to affect all of us for generations to come. We have to understand this is not going away simply because it isn't in today's news report, although it will, you know, it is somewhere. The BP disaster has contaminated the seas and all of this stuff from both Fukushima and BP will down as rain. It will, it's already destroying the food chain. Parts of the oceans are dead. This is, you know, and I, I don't mean to go into doom and gloom. My fire warned about this in 51, about this atomic power stuff, power plants, dangerous, bad, don't do it. He's been warning about environmental destruction since 51 or earlier. What he has said and been told recently is that by 2020, there's a very good chance that in the US, we will have anarchy here. Now this is way out there kind of stuff, but let's remember that as early as 1981 and 87, he foretold two civil wars coming to America. We can see now the polarization, culturally, politically, racially, religiously, increases. People are under all sorts of increased stress. The financial situations are breaking down, and they will continue to break down. We've been warned about this. Thing. So, do we just conclude this and say, well, it's doom and gloom and there's nothing we can do about it? No. He is still of a mind that there are things that each individual human being can do that can start to make course corrections to some degree. We're in these messes because human beings went in the wrong direction for too long. There's nobody coming to save us. There's no ascended masters. There's no angels. There's no gods. There's no group. It's not outside of us. This context is about helping us to help ourselves assure our own future survival. We don't have to contract in fear and desperation. If anything, we should be accessing our own internal joy. We should be concentrating and meditating and looking to connect with other human beings who simply want to do those things to correct their thinking and their feelings and their actions towards peace, love, freedom, and harmony. It sounds simplistic, but who doesn't want those things? And look how far we are from it. Lots of stuff is coming. We just have to be, you know, that term spiritual warriors is probably an appropriate one. We buck up, we say, okay, we're in these times. They are interesting. They're challenging. Love, peace, freedom, harmony. If I maintain my focus on those things as much as I can. I vibrate that way. I start to correct myself. It radiates out. We link up with each other. 
And then we realize it's never been about UFOs. It's never been about extraterrestrials. They've been through this. They had a world that was basically destroyed by atomic energy plants when they had things like meteorite strikes or earthquakes that ruptured those plants. They want us to go right to deep geothermal energy. You know, the Big Island has got plenty of that. And well, so does every place on Earth. You sink a shaft and you let that, that heat energy come up into a facility with turbines and far more effective than solar, far more effective than wind. You can use those other things, but we don't need nuclear power plants to continue to poison. So there is so much here. Look, Michael, I really want to thank you for joining us right here at Third Phase of Moon, and we're going to have you back, and hopefully we could have the public and the Third Phase of Moon viewers ask you the questions, and uh, we'd hope to set this up and let everybody know about that. I'd love it. Thank you. All right, Michael, and if uh, anybody out there has captured anything incredible, like Billy Meyer, hey, you can send it to Third Phase of Moon via Skype or Facebook, and also check out the link below and watch the full-length feature right here at Third Phase of Moon, the Billy Meyer uh, story, full insight. Check the link, and I'm sure you'll be amazed. Everybody, keep your eyes on the skies. My name's Blake Cousins, and we'll see you again next time. Third Phase of Moon.